Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, and welcome back to Cities on the Frontline. This is our speaker series, number 31, around a critical topic of climate change governance. Uh, my name is Lauren Sorkin, and I'm the Executive Director of the Resilient Cities Network based in Singapore. And it's my pleasure to welcome you back to the series that we co-host with the World Bank Group. A reminder to everyone as we're starting out tonight of the ground rules for these sessions. These sessions are organized for practitioners, cities, and those who are helping cities as they respond and recover from COVID-19. During these sessions, our speakers are giving you their best knowledge from their practical experience. These sessions are not on the record, and so we ask that if you do want to share their practices or quotes from the session in the media that you reach out to us and we will clear that with the speakers themselves. And now I will also remind everyone that we will be posting all of the session materials after this on our website and also that we'll be using the chat function and the Q&A function that you can find along your screen for the interactive part of the session. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce my co-host for this evening, Uri Reich from the World Bank. Thank you very much, Lauren, and welcome to everyone. On behalf of the World Bank Cities Resilient Program, welcome. Uh, so my name is Uri Reich, and I'm a senior urban specialist in the South and East <clears throat> Asia regions. As a background, as we know, COVID-19 is still running its course, while resilience challenges related to rapid urbanization, natural disasters, and climate change still remain. According to Brian Strong, for example, the Chief Resilience Officer for San Francisco, there are no projections of sea level rise slowing down as a result of COVID. Similarly, from a financial point of view, there's a compounding crisis on the city budgets consisting on significant and unexpected costs, notably on the health sector, with significant revenue reductions, mostly on capital expenditures. Still, the COVID pandemic has opened opportunities to address several urban challenges. Uh, in our earlier sessions, for example, we heard from the city of Milan how the <clears throat> lockdown reduced pollution levels by about 40%. We have also heard how other cities uh, in uh, places like Addis, Bogota, or Kampala are creating new back lanes, for example, to reduce the risk of COVID transmissions and decrease congestion, pollution, and greenhouses emissions. Um, what other actions are cities taking or are contemplating to address long-term climate risks as they start to think about recovering from the pandemic? These are interesting questions, and today we have a great um, a <clears throat> presenters uh, that will shed some light on these challenging topics. So let me just briefly introduce our four speakers for, uh, for the day. Um, we have Arno Morlar, who is the Chief Resilience Officer for the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Arno has a degree in physical geography from the University of Utrecht and has professional experience from France, New Zealand, and the Netherlands. He served as deputy head of the Rotterdam Water Management Department and as manager of the Rotterdam Climate Proof Program. In his role, he initiated the International Connecting Delta Cities Network and became the regional coordinator with the Dutch research program, Knowledge for Climate, and was responsible for the design and implementation of the Rotterdam Adaptation Strategy. Arnaud also led the city of Rotterdam toward a leading position on innovative urban water management and climate adaptation. We also have with us uh, today, Dr. Duncan Booker, who's the COP26 stakeholder manager for the Glasgow City Council. Uh, Duncan has worked on policy development in local governments for more than 20 years. During his career, he drafted the council's report and recommendations on climate emergency in 2019 which led to the city committing to achieve carbon neutrality by the, by the year 2030. Duncan is currently working on arrangements for Glasgow to host the COP26 in November 2021. He has degrees from Oxford and Glasgow universities. We also have with us Desmond Afia, who's the Chief Sustainability and Resilience Advisor to the Mayor of Accra in Ghana. Desmond is also the C40 City Advisor for Accra, responsible for the development of the Paris Agreement Compliant Climate Action Plan. 
Desmond served as Chief Resilience Officer of ACRA and led the development of a resilient strategy for the city. He has led many initiatives in the private and public sector to design and implement proactive environmental health and safety systems in Ghana and internationally. And last but not least, we have Dr. Joshua Ben Castan, who is urban, who's an urban ecologist with the Center with the Care Earth Trust in Chennai, India. Dr. Jashir works on conservation and sustain, <clears throat> sustainable use of biodiversity and ecological restoration with a focus on wetlands. She established Care Air Trust, an NGO in Chennai that has been working on biodiversity and urban ecology for the past 18 years. In 2009, the Trust was awarded India's highest award by the Ministry of the Environment, Forest and Climate Change for the pioneer work on conservation and restoration. Dr. Jashir has over 30 scientific publications, including one book, and she currently serves as CARES Earth Managing Trustee. Okay, so there will be two rounds of questions. Uh, let's start with the first one, which focuses on global commitments uh, and the role of cities. Um, Rotterdam uh, will host the, global center, uh, host the Global Center of Adaptation and will be hosting the Climate Adaptation Summit next January in 2021. And Glasgow will host the next uh, COP later in November 2021. So Arnaud and Duncan, both of you are heavily involved in each event uh, and the work leading to that. Um, so Duncan, let's start with you. Uh, the COP26 uh, 26 will be one of the most important climate summits in terms of global commitments. And since you are closely involved in the preparations, can you please share the actions that Glasgow has taken to set the example towards becoming a greener city in preparation for the COP? And more broadly, what can we expect as the main headlines of the event? Over to you, Arno. Thank you. And Lauren, and it's lovely to meet everyone here today on this webinar. Uh, it's always a pleasure to engage with other cities around the world. Glasgow recently reviewed our international strategy and the membership and recommitment to the Resilient Cities Network came out as a very high priority. So uh, welcome to all of you from Glasgow, the proud host city of COP26 next year, uh, and it's always wonderful to make common cause with our urban peers from around the world because my contention is that our histories are very much similar. Uh, our challenges are very much shared uh, and our futures are very much the same ones that we want to make as we look to transform ourselves once again into low carbon and climate resilient places. And it's that particular, I suppose, idea and history of transformation which is at the heart of Glasgow as the host city for COP. Because I always say Glasgow is not perfect, but we are therefore ideal to be the host city for COP26. Because if we can make it here in Glasgow, you can make it elsewhere across the world. And I want to just focus a little bit more on that transformation. Next slide, please, Alex. You see here Glasgow as one of the great industrial cities of the world. Uh, moving on to uh, another image here. Um, Alex, can you just press forward, please? It's not, it's not moved on. Thank you. Moving on to the city we now have, one that is looking to make that transition to a cleaner, greener economy and society, uh, and one where the city offers a very high urban quality of life for everyone, where justice and equality is at the heart of what we believe is our role and place as a city. Next slide, please. And one of the messages we are putting across to the world for COP26 is that whilst nation states make pledges, or sometimes fail to agree all that much, it is cities which are delivering on the promise of a low carbon and climate resilient future. Cities on this call and places like Glasgow. The image you have before you shows our 37% reduction in carbon emissions from our baseline year of 2006. We're proud of that, but we also know there is no room for complacency, and we need to go a lot harder if we are to achieve the things that the IPCC says we need to do to keep planetary temperatures within that 1.5 degrees centigrade maximum increase set by the Paris Agreement. Next slide, please. So one of the things we did in Glasgow last year was declare, like many other cities, a climate emergency. Uh, and we set ourselves a really challenging target of achieving carbon neutrality as a city by the year 2030. And we're just currently consulting with our people 
on this implementation plan, the cover of which you see before you, and there'll be a link at the end of this uh, presentation to take you back if you want to have a look at it. And again, it's another example of where cities like Glasgow are dealing with the heritage of our post-industrial history, lots of vacant and derelict land, uh, the, the long tail of problems as, as we've looked to restructure industries towards the low carbon uh, and climate resilient side of things, uh, and also to create decent places for our people. I was on a call just earlier with uh, our place commission, which is looking at how we can improve access to green and open space and make sure that that's equitable across the whole city. Uh, and in that light, let me move to the next slide, please. One of the things we've tried to do during the COVID crisis is to make sure that we give space to our people for, bike, bike, for bicycles and for walking, and to try, therefore, to make a transformation in the city where the private motor car is no longer dominant. And this is a really difficult thing in Glasgow. Most people live in flats. They do not have access to gardens. So municipal green space and open space is a really important issue. And that's one of the key things we're trying to do in the run up to COP. Most people in Glasgow do not have a car. So getting around the city with a high quality public transport system is really important. But after COVID, of course, for many of you, public transport is very difficult because of physical distancing issues. So we're quite clear in Glasgow that we need to try to retain the gains we have made during the COVID crisis as we look once more to face the climate emergency, which we already knew to be looming over us. Next slide, please. And, and finally, if, if what I say sounds like it's all about big institutions talking to each other, above all else, it is about engaging with our people in their diverse communities. We're very clear in Glasgow, when we engaged upon our resilience journey, um, one of the first messages we got from our people was that a more just and fair city was the, the sustainable basis of a resilient city, no matter what future challenges we might face in terms of shocks and stresses. Uh, and one of the things, the messages we want to get to the world as host city for COP26 is that sustainability and social justice must go together, both locally for our most vulnerable population uh, and across the globe, as Glasgow acknowledges our own complicity in the transatlantic slave trade and our role in empire, which has left zones of conflict across Africa and the Middle East with the lines on, on maps that our, our grandf grandparents left. So we're very clear about that. And if I can just quote, therefore, one final point to you from our climate emergency plan, we have two key points. First thing, that actions to address the climate crisis must not further disadvantage people and communities who already experience significant inequalities. And secondly, that actions to create a safer and more sustainable city should also be aimed at building a just and more equal city. I think these are key messages that Glasgow gives to ourselves here in the city and across the world. And I'm sure they're the same messages you'll be telling each other in your cities. I'll end there and just ask for one final slide with some uh, links to the current consultations that we've, we've got for you to look at. Thank you so much for your time. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much, Duncan. I mean, that was so well well said. And, and of course, in, in this forum, I think you'll get a lot of agreement that while nation states are making commitments, it is cities who deliver. I, I want to actually follow up on that and, and zero in on how we are looking to operationalize and streamline climate change adaptation in cities. And I'm going to turn the next question over to Jay Shri actually, and um, someone who certainly has a lot of experience bridging that space between communities, ecosystems, and thinking through very carefully these aspects of climate justice um, and, and, and equi equity in Chennai. So, uh, Jayshree, you, you have this extensive experience in Chennai working on very uh, varied adaptation projects. What kind of reflections do you have on this experience and what happened during COVID? Did it add to the challenges, or are you seeing opportunities to link climate adaptation um, and pandemic response? Points of post-COVID scenarios. Okay, may I have the next slide, please? The fact that Chennai is a densely populated uh, 
metropolitan cities of India. In fact, it's the 36th largest city of in the world. What is more critical to us in the context of the questions that uh, uh, Lauren asked are the following. First, the, this is a coastal city which is located along the warm sea of Bay, Bay of Bengal. The coast serves both as a kind of a protector as well as the habitat that induces uh, uh, vulnerability. Because uh, as I speak to you, we are just trying to recover from uh, the aftermath of a cyclone which cross landed this morning to a large scale devastation in terms of flooding and water logging. We have not even uh, assessed the basic damage that has been incurred. But what also influences our ability to assimilate new ideas, our ability to address issues of equity is the fact that we have a colonial legacy. I'm certainly not somebody who blames the British for everything bad. I understand and recognize the fact that you have benefited a lot of this year. But the fact is the cities that have been carved out by the British have been on a kind of a linear linear approach. In fact, we've used up much of the adjacent rural and fishing hamlets to become you know, become a city. What it has resulted in is the following. It has created Hello. We can still hear you. We can still hear you. Oh, now we cannot. I think the audio from the phone was coming through very clearly, Jayshree. Are you still connected? Apologies, everyone. We're going to sort out the audio. Just a moment. We can hear you again. Yeah, we are losing the audio again. It, it may be because of the connections and what's going on because of the cyclone, if possible. Um, why don't we take a moment and try to reconnect? Jay Shri? Now, yes, now we can hear you. Can you continue on, on that line? I do that. Yeah. Is it better now? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Now, what it is also meant is, I was talking about that mosaic and the habitat mosaic actually make any kind of planning very difficult. But, but, but more importantly, it also leads to in a big way among the government in a big way. It seems Jay Street that we've lost the audio yet again. Uh, I, we, we were hearing about the mosaic habitat, and then after that, uh, the audio has cut out. Let us work with you to to resolve the audio issue in the background. Um, let's let's take down down the slide for a moment. Okay, and while we work on the Con connecting the Chennai audio properly. Let's turn to another city that has also um, a lot of experience very recently 
really operationalizing their climate change plan. We have Desmond Akia on the line from Accra, from Ghana, and Accra boldly launched their climate action plan during the pandemic, right in the middle. And so, Desmond, can you share with us more about this journey in developing the plan and how the pandemic affected the direction of the plan? Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lorraine. I hope uh, the audio is much better. Um, I think it would be good to just give a bit of a background about uh, Accra and um, the work that we've been doing um, over the past couple of years uh, on resilience, which in a way um, became very, came in very handy in this past uh, couple of months. Um, so can I get the next slide, please? Um, so we launched our resilience strategy a couple of uh, years ago, and through that strategy development process, we identified some of the huge potential stresses and uh, things that could affect us. And it appears it was important that we went through that process. And uh, so when the COVID hit, and um, we had to. Um, I understand my network is um, playing up, so maybe I could go on video and then just talk. Um, so if you could go on the next slide, please. Um, so our city has about uh, 1.6 million uh, people, um, the last estimate, and um, we are largely informal uh, economy. And so when you have a large informal economy, and um, about 70% to 80% of our, our people work in the informal sector. We've also grown quite largely in the, 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 the picture down on the right below shows how quickly the city has expanded uh, laterally. And that also affects how we plan in um, uh, issues. Please go to the next slide. So um, during the development of the uh, resilience strategy, Three key things were very prominent uh, for us. One was the approach that we use in our infrastructure development mm -hmm. and how we provide services. And um, I'm bringing these up because it really has an impact on how we, we manage um, to manage uh, the COVID. Uh, can I have the next slide? Another issue that was quite prominent also um, was the issue of um, optimizing the existing resources to ensure accountability. And strangely, when local government is at the forefront of fighting the pandemic, these become quite prominent because confidence in uh, how mm -hmm. people perceive uh, the local government and even track the decisions that mm -hmm. local government makes uh, in terms of, in our case, closing markets and um, enforcing uh, market for a couple of days, spraying all the places and ensuring that people buy into the vision of leadership uh, became very um, uh, prominent and the last slide and then I'll just give the, the, the background and uh, so based on all these factors uh, and we appreciating that we are an informal system shows that the strategies that we use whenever we have a challenge or we have an issue would be very different and so in the midst of the uh, pandemic and we were working on our release our climate action plan the engagement we've had with the informal sector and also the formal sector, appreciating that stakeholder engagement, the level of engagement in terms of ensuring that people were part of the decision-making process came in very handy. And interestingly, we also recognized uh, in this process that when we came out with any policy, the government, central government has set out um, activating what we call a, a disaster response uh, program. So there was a level of agencies at the local level that had to be activated, including the mayor's committee, mayor head security agencies, and um, the medical sector, and the medical doctor for the district or the metropolis needs this agency. And they at the point, it was more about contact tracing because the cases Accra became the hotspot. But we also recognize in the informal sector, you go to places where they have about seven people to a room, and how you do 
contact tracing and try to ensure the social distancing became a challenge. But the structures that had been put in place in terms of ensuring engagement with the community, ensuring engagement with local leaders also came into focus. And um, this, these things had an impact on how we engaged to reduce the cases that we had and also to ensure that uh, people were following an enforcement. There was also another aspect in terms of a social network to support um, the, the, the informal sector, especially the settlement. If you have areas that are prone to flooding, there's pressure on housing, which is one of our challenges, and so there are a lot of informal settlements, and engaging in those informal settlements was also a big issue. We also were able to ensure that people appreciated the level of education and awareness in the community and how we went into communities to engage. For instance, um, the PR unit or the public relations unit of the assembly had to change the way they were engaging. It was not just cheap television and radio adverts, but using public address systems in the communities. They go into the communities to go and engage them. And so these examples showed us that when you have an appreciation of the setup of your communities, you appreciate the, even the local political dynamics in the community, appreciating that it's a highly informal system, appreciating that the economic impacts of the COVID, um, um, I, I want to use the word fighting the COVID, but I'm not too sure if that is the, the right word to use, but the tools that at your disposal to use based on your structures and how it affects us, help us to kind of fashion uh, some of these things out. We also ease the restrictions. There was a lockdown for only a very short period, but we ease the restrictions uh, because we realized the impact on the economy was becoming a little too much because of the structure. And so we ease the restrictions, but change the enforcement um, mechanism. I mean, ensuring that mask wearing became kind of standardized. In this same period, we had to release our climate action plan, and the pillars that we went on was one, stakeholder engagement, um, also um, appreciating that you have high informal system, and then also ensuring that people bought into um, the climate action plan. So in our resilience strategy, there are 27 actions. In our climate action plan, there are 20 actions, and these are all tied in to address the same issues of how to ensure that the city can thrive. And so these were some of the um, key uh, issues that we looked at. If there are questions, I'm sure that we'll be able to look at them uh, as they come along. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you so much, Desmond. We're going to try to come back to Jay Shri to see if the audio is now working better. Yeah. Uh, I'm very sorry about what happened then. Uh, just collapsed with no reason whatsoever. I'm sorry about that. Am I clear you're, now? You're very or clear. Please, please come. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, I thought it was a kind of a divine intervention, I think, to establish whatever I was saying as accurate. There is a lot of uncertainty in Chennai, and it's been the case, especially since 2002. 2002 seems to be a trigger year for Chennai, and when we look at a kind of a data set of 200 plus years, we realize that 2002 is a benchmark year of sort, which is when Chennai really started experiencing in real time the kind of impact potential as well as real time impact that climate change can bring into urban environments. What it has now resulted is a set of transformed fragmented habitats. The city doesn't exist as a holistic unit, and this seems to be the biggest deterrent that we have in terms of building resilience to the city of Chennai. The next slide, please. So what are the challenges? In fact, the first point may seem actually like an opportunity, but the fact of the matter is the state has drafted at least a couple of state action plans. This is very beautifully written because it's been supported by the and there's 
a lot of technical data, a lot of architecture in terms of how the report is organized and how the duties have been charted out. But the fact of the matter is, this report seems to be of relevance only to the top level of the bureaucracy. Down below, at the level of the frontline workers, when you ask them what climate change is, they still talk about the polar bear on a piece of melting ice. It's something that's not of any relevance to the frontline workers, and they are the people who are on ground trying to do things. And so that's a big, big challenge that we are encountering. The second challenge that we face, which is something I'm sure most countries do, is the fact that there's absolutely very little horizontal or vertical integration within the government. So nobody talks to the other. They're all discharging their duties. In fact, the term discharging their duties seems to be overriding above everything else. The third is we have a set of archive overriding laws. These laws were put in place when the British were colonizing India. Many of these laws are no longer longer relevant, but they're still there because nobody has the guts, the bandwidth to repeal it. And these laws really play really havoc. Nobody seems to have an understanding of why these laws still exist, but the fact is they cross a big impact when it comes to building resilience, especially with the civil society. Then climate change is not a priority for the policy, for the political systems. In fact, this morning as we were discussing the impact of the cyclone which hit us early morning and the, the fact that people were being congregated into uh, shelters, cyclone shelters. We still have shelters, by the way. And one of the concerns that I put forth was, how, how are you planning to have social distancing in this era of COVID? The response was, COVID is not a priority to us now. Saving lives is priority. So this is the kind of approach that we encounter almost on a daily basis. And there is absolutely uh, no way we can actually talk about resilience to a political system which is not even aware of the basics. Then, of course, we don't have locally relevant databases. As I said, we still talk about the polar bear on the melting ice cap. Nobody seems to understand that whatever is happening is actually the tip of the iceberg and it's possibly related to climate change. So we get thrown, up, thrown out of many meetings when we talk about it. Primarily because we're not able to convincingly use numerical models or numerical data to establish that climate change is actually a reality and it's already hitting Chennai in a big way. Then finally, of course, we don't have an expert group which can aid evidence-based policy. Much of what is being said is external, and this is not working very well in Chennai. The next slide, please. The challenges that I outlined may have seemed a bit outlandish. In fact, it have seemed that I have a kind of an anti-establishment attitude, but it's really not the case. I outlined those challenges in the most explicit manner because I want to convert all those challenges, or I think we should all attempt to convert all those challenges into opportunities. And the first opportunity that presents itself is, I mean, this is something that I'm very proud of, and let me repeat it for possibly the hundredth time. Chennai is the knowledge capital of India especially in the spheres of science and technology. And I think that needs to be leveraged in a big way if we have to make, make a difference and if we have to build resilience. The second factor is we have a very effective government. The political government is one of the most receptive governments in the country, especially because it's highly federal in character. We've been ruled by regional parties, as opposed to national parties for quite a long time. And this is one of the reasons why the water leverage project, which was fostered by the, nurtured by the Dutch special envoy on water, Mr. Henkoming, found a ready acceptance with the government. In fact, they're very thrilled about it and they're looking forward to all these projects being translated on ground. The third factor, which I think we are trying to capitalize is there is good institutional memory and some of this memory dates back to the period 1930, 1931. So this is something that we could capitalize on to make sure that whatever we are attempting to do is, is plausible is possible. Both. Then, of course, there are good opportunities to scale up. In fact, uh, Tamil Nadu as a state of which Chennai is a part is actually tired of uh, pilot projects. They're looking for large scale projects because in the past, large scale projects seem to have worked better as compared to pilot projects. And that's something of an opportunity that I think we need to capitalize. And then they have the best record, veritable record of collaborating with multilateral agencies. I'm aware of the fact that many agencies actually find it very easy to work with the Tamil Nadu government, largely because you have also very active civil society group. In fact, it's a highly informed uh, civil society that Tamil Nadu and Chennai have. It is an added advantage, and even a small intervention can actually play a very significant role in building resilience. And finally, the possibility of civil society action. 
This is certainly not a city where people just talk and be done with it. It's a city where the citizens actually come out to the roads to participate, to collaborate, to co-leverage, and mutually support any kind of an intervention. And I think that is a big strength that has not been used to the maximum or used to the ideal extent in the past, and I think we need to focus on that. To sum up whatever I had to say, this is something that I always say, and let me repeat it. I think all our efforts should result in a point where the local government and the local society tell us that they've had enough and more of what needs to be done. They have assimilated it well, and they have the bandwidth to actually explore opportunities and build the resilience of the city. We have not yet, unfortunately, reached a point at that point. Thank you. Yes, it's an excellent uh, presentation, and uh, I actually uh, work extensively in Chennai and cannot be agree with you more on the huge opportunities that there are in the city to start addressing all these challenges that you have uh, mentioned. Very, very interesting. Now, let's let's uh, go a little bit back again uh, to the global commitments uh, in the role of cities. We have now with us uh, in Professor Arnon, Dr. Arnon. So, Arnon, can you please share with us the objectives of the Global Center on Adaptation? Uh, and what is the role that cities play in accelerating climate resilience? What is the objective of the Climate Adaptation Summit and what we should expect? Thank you. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thanks for inviting me to explain this. And uh, very sorry that uh, I, I, I somehow I, I, I couldn't succeed uh, with the connection at the beginning. So uh, let me uh, sh straight away start uh, because I only have a few minutes to touch upon what's going on in Rotterdam and then what is going to happen, uh, what we foresee and what we would like to see happen on a more global scale. So uh, the next slide, please. please. Um, looking at uh, Rotterdam, of course, I think uh, you know, well, for those who haven't been here, I think it's good to explain that we are a coastal city. Um, and water is coming from all directions, uh, so to say. Uh, uh, the sea level is rising, groundwater levels changing, extreme rainfall, the river discharges are changing. So actually you could say doing not, uh, nothing is not an option. And that is, uh, next slide please, uh, what we have been doing uh, actually for more than a decade now. These are not uh, artist impressions, these are uh, the, uh, pictures of, of the sites um, in, in, the, in the city and in the region. So actually, we, we, you could say we have, been, we have been starting with with an overall more holistic uh, climate adaptation program. Um, now, I think uh, last year we have been launching <clears throat> the second generation of uh, adaptation strategy and, and well, for nearly 10 years already implementing uh, stuff. And uh, well, having said that, there is a lot of information that, 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 that we can share, of course, as we are, we are happy to share with, with, with other cities uh, about this process, but also about uh, the, the innovations behind these, these measures. And it's, 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 it varies uh, from, from a floating development up to uh, a creative uh, a water storage in public spaces and, and green roofs programs, et cetera. Um, but next slide, please. But of course, we are not uh, now altogether uh, uh, only in the climate uh, crisis. We are also now in the other crisis, and that's uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure that all cities are thinking about about the recovery and about resilient recovery. I hope, um, and in Rotterdam, we uh, I'm really glad to see that the politicians came up with. Uh, a package of measures, of course. One of the measures is to to um, uh, start investing in uh, the big seven, as we call it, the, the, the seven big uh, uh, projects in the city. Uh, and why is this important? Because it's creating jobs. It's, it's good for the economical uh, recovery, you could say. But it is also a resilient recovery because it's including greening and uh, a focus on climate adaptation and social resilience. Uh, so I think that's that's uh, that's uh, well I think a crucial thing uh, uh, for for cities to to to, uh, to to start with. Why I uh, picked out this this artist impression in this case uh, because in the middle you see um, the impression of the floating office of uh, the global center and that's the link to the next slide. So um, uh, Rotterdam became the host uh, city, the, the headquarters of the global center on adaptation. This is a center. 
um, uh, initiated by a, a, a UN, the World Bank, and uh, the, the Dutch uh, government. Um, and there is uh, the, the, the CEO established a, a, a two-year global commission, and the commission is run by Ban Ki Moon, uh, the eighth uh, Secretary General of the UN, and Bill Gates and uh, Kristalina Georgieva, and a lot of other commissioners. This global commission on adaptation announced uh, to organize a summit, a summit on uh, in January the 25th, and and then they will sunset, and then uh, the center and other partners will take over uh, the, the the work, uh, so to speak, for the coming next decade. Next slide, please. Um, and during that summit on January the 25th, uh, for which I invite everybody to join, of course, there will be a focus on several things. And uh, first of all, we will organize, we in this case is Rotterdam together with the GCA, will organize a mayor's forum. And um, uh, followed by, there will be a high level meeting with, with uh, the, the heads of states, etc. followed by um, events related to several what they call the action tracks and one of the action tracks is focusing on cities and in this action track we said okay let's uh, uh, let's let's um, uh, form a coalition of strong partners and that is in this case the gca and the wri uh, the resilient city network of course the c40 and the un habitat and, um, and the idea is to, to, to launch uh, uh, well, a global program, and we called it the Thousand Cities uh, Adapt Now program. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, so, okay. I already mentioned that these, these, uh, the, the core group, and there are a lot of other partners uh, involved uh, already uh, connected to several, uh, you could say, actions in this, in this program. Next slide, please. Um, and, and, but I think the content is more important. So the idea is um, because I haven't said that yet, the, the, the overall ambition of this center and the commission is to accelerate adaptation worldwide and to launch a, 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 a 10 year program, uh, how, how to do this. And, and, um, and this, this track is about the city's uh, component. And the idea is uh, to, uh, to cluster uh, existing programs and and uh, and, and and funding and uh, uh, related institutes. So that's already the first part of what we call a defragmented offer. Uh, but we also are, um, are able to get new funding. We do already have some new funding. Of course, we need more funding for the whole 10 year. But for the first years, we do have uh, a starting funding for a, a, a first batch of cities. And we will focus on, uh, on capacity building, helping cities with uh, developing strategies um, and uh, implementable uh, action plans. Um, uh, and, and of course, it will also be about uh, scaling from uh, cities to, to, uh, to, to, to more cities via, for example, peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, using our networks and also a new adaptation a hub that is being developed by the, the Dutch ministry, uh, including solutions, uh, and then I'm nearly there, on MBS and, and nature-based solutions and, and water-related uh, actions, um, and also a focus, a very strong focus, I have to say, on um, uh, the vulnerable communities uh, via a locally-led action uh, pathway. And this all is something that we want to be to uh, to announce via what we call a joint statement on that day. And um, next slide, please. So that's that's actually what's going on on this on this well uh, uh, high level. Um, uh, and now I want to co to conclude to to, well, to the to audience. It's uh, it's 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 possible to to join this uh, climate adaptation summit. And uh, I also want to end with a call for action and a call for for funders to join this, this uh, global program. Thank you. You highlighted how much is going on and the momentum that's really building towards this January date. And I think that that picks up on the sense of urgency that we've heard in all of the presentations. There's, there's a question that's come in in the chat um, specifically around this kind of collaboration. And the, the question is really whether Prop 26 and the adaptation form, are they going to include more of 
the inner circle from cities of the people who are really on the front lines making this accelerated action possible. Um, and I think that's an interesting question because I think that the speaker is getting at perhaps that these these summits can often be high level or political. And Jayshree's point is that's fine. But if the people who are on the front lines don't understand the relationship of the policy to their everyday job, how do we make the change at that scale? So I think, you know, the question here is, how do we really engage cities to enable them to deliver? And, you know, in, in your cities, right, in Rotterdam, which has made so many strides, in um, Glasgow, where, Duncan, you gave the inspiring call that, you know, we're not perfect, but if we can do it here, anyone can do it. What has enabled that change? And I'd like, you know, Jayshree and Desmond, for you to also answer that as, as well, because I think, Jayshree, you started to touch on what's possible. Where is that happening and how does it speed up? Because we only have this 10 years, right? We were running out of time. There is a sense of urgency. How do we actually get there? How do we get to that capacity at the speed and scale that is required? So you want me to reply first, Lauren? Or You've unmuted, so now you're on. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I, I, I didn't understand uh, cor correctly who you wanted to, to answer that question. So, but yes, I, I fully agree, of course, because this, this is all, you could say, high level and a lot of talking and making plans and announcements. Uh, but at the end, it is about what's going to happen on the ground. And I can assure you that, that, that that's my, my role because I am a practitioner and I, 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 I try to, to bring these experiences, but also this, this piece of action into the, into the program. And I, I, I forgot to mention that we already started and, 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 and actually we, we started in Accra. So I, I know Desmond and, uh, and we were already able to help his first action mentioned in the action plan of, of Accra. And that is doing a, a real deep dive, uh, a, a risk uh, adaptation, risk assessment, and translate the outcome into, uh, uh, you could say, climate-proof spatial planning. So, and, and this is what what we want, and to and to get to get this upscaled. And I think the the, the city networks in this in this in this respect are, are crucial because. We 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 do have a WhatsApp group <laughs> with our names. That's 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 the level that, that we are talking about. And um, we are also working together with Surat, for example. Um, but yeah, so but that's only two cities. So we want to accelerate this uh, to 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 more cities. And that's well, of course, to a certain level, also depending on funding. So can you share that view or? Would you would you add to that? Uh, absolutely, thank you, Lauren. Thank you for the question. Uh, to give you to give you the most tangible example of what this means, um, the target year for the United Kingdom to achieve carbon neutrality set by our Committee on Climate Change is 2045. The target year for Scotland within the United Kingdom is 2040, uh, and Glasgow has set 2030 as our target year. So what we say is that achievement for Glasgow will be success for Scotland or for the UK. And I think that profoundly shows how cities are contributing. To, to the questioner in the chat function uh, who asked about will cities have more of an inner circle role in COP26, um, we are becoming aware of the possibility of a Cities and Regions Day within the formal Blue Zone program at COP26. We think there will be a Cities and Regions Pavilion um, and that's been particularly promoted by our friends in the city of Sao Paulo. And I think there are other opportunities for networks such as this one to engage with us. We're very clear that we want to be a welcoming host city. And so in addition to the blue and green zones that traditionally accompany a COP event, um, we will be opening our own municipal assets, particularly the city chambers, to invite other cities and your mayors to discussions during COP with other cities. And, and that's certainly an offer that that I've made to the Brazilian Cities Network, and I hope, hope we can meet in person in COP next November. I think we're very eager to take you up on that and uh, to convene and, and to extend that capacity. Jayshree, you spoke of some pr pretty difficult uh, challenges in governance, but also some really profound opportunities. What is it going to take to speed things up in, in Chennai?
I have a few ideas. The first thing is that we learn in my own experience. I like to make that very clear to you. First of all, we need to role leaders play, not, I'm not discounting the role of the leadership that he plays. We need people like that to set the agenda, to participate in international meetings, to get from there and participated efforts need to go into work with the local down. Very Unfortunately, I think we, we lost the audio, but I think what we can do is we can record. Oh. We, we are unfortunately getting the audio only about half of it. So I think what we can do um, best, Jayshree, is perhaps to record an additional Q&A with you and we can post it along with the, the webinar. That way we can get the complete answers and also share them with a wider audience. Um, so what, what I will do now is sure, just to sure, turn sure. the question to Desmond. Sure. Desmond, are you able to hear us? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Hello, Lauren, I can hear you. Great. Do you want to share with us, Desmond, now in terms of accelerating the climate action? in Accra, what needs to happen to ground all of the excellent plans that you spoke to earlier? Uh, thank you, well, I'm glad that um, we've been having conversations, myself and Arnold, and um, I think it's, it's one of the, the key things is being clear about what it is that we want to achieve out of the process. And I think in the Climate Action Plan, it is clear that we want to be able to reduce the sources of our emissions. And so having identified those sources, it's a lot easier to be able to now move to the next phase. And so I think um, there are a couple of questions also about specific actions. We identify that our key sources of emissions are in the waste sector, from the transport sector, and also in energy. And so our actions are geared towards that. But we also had identified that spatial planning would have a great impact on um, all these actions, uh, all these uh, sectors that I've talked about. And we are glad that the Global Center on Adaptation is working with us uh, to, to be able to move to developing a proper or a new uh, local special action plan for the Central Business District. So, and um, all this has to be in context of our previous works that we have done in, in resilience, which identified those that are most at risk in terms of the informal sector, the informal settlement, and also the structure of our economy. And so these things are all kind of tied in to ensure that the actions that we end up with or the activities that we implement can have a real impact on the lives of the people. So those are some of the key areas that uh, we are looking at and working on. Thank you for that, Desmond. We're actually coming very close to, to the time. We have only five minutes remaining. We actually wanted to give um, each of the participants uh, a chance to give us a closing thought. Um, it's very difficult to summarize, I think, uh, around climate governance in one thought, but we have some fantastic um, convenings coming up as well as actions that everyone's been talking about. So we'll give each of the speakers just a chance to give a closing thought. If we can start with uh, with you, Arnaud, again, we will come to you, um, then to, to Desmond and, and Duncan and Jayshree. We'll, we'll try to end with you if we can. Uh, yeah, always difficult to come up with a, a final statement or thoughts. Um, and 
but I uh, what what I what what I just want to put on the table is I think um, additional to mitigation and 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 uh, uh, CO2 emission reductions etc. I think we all have to uh, right away and and as soon as possible start to adapt. And so and a lot of cities are are doing this, but. It's, it's complicated because it's somehow not sexy. It's not not high on the agenda. So let's let's well let's work together uh, as cities, but also with a, with the partners like, for example, the Global Centre to to find out how we can get it higher on the agenda, and um, and then and then invest in parallel in in two things, and that's developing a holistic strategy, but also right away start there with with implementing things, including especially uh, the vulnerable communities. And, uh, well, and at the end, of course, I would also always like uh, uh, to end with uh, inviting people to join the Climate Adaptation Summit. Excellent. And looking forward to, to be active on the COP26 after this uh, summit, of course, yeah. Excellent. So in, implement, 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 invest, and adapt join the, during the summit, which will be full of lessons uh, on how to do so. Coming right, are you, are you able to unmute Dustin or we'll go to Duncan? Um, I, I couldn't hear you, but um, the initial part was a summary. And um, I think that the key issues that we would say from Accra is that we need to build collaboration and um, collaboration with both local and international partners uh, because there's a lot of knowledge and experience sharing which would also guide the global south cities to be making the right policy decisions and also in implementation of actions which have worked and so there's not like starting from zero but that we are building on uh, from where, where we are. And then I, one of the last things uh, is that we have identified that vertical integration um, is a key issue uh, because if local governments develop plans that have no bearing on the national level policy direction, I think it becomes more difficult to be able to implement, especially in the kind of uh, government structure that we have in Ghana. And so I would just is collaboration, vertical integration, and then knowledge and experience sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll come to you, Duncan. And, and I appreciate the comments that my two previous colleagues have uh, just made. I think for me, above all else, um, as cities that have experienced already the effects of enormous transformational change in our economy and society, uh, we need to ensure we make a reality about the principles of a just transition uh, and ensure that our responses to climate change uh, build both safer and more just form of society for all our people. And that means we need to continue to have a meaningful dialogue with all our communities, not just across our agencies, but with our people as well. So well said, Duncan, and certainly that those are principles that we hold very, very dear and are looking forward to continuing to ad advancing with you. Um, I'm not sure, Jayshree, if you are able to unmute and quickly share a thought with us or, ah, you've shared it in the chat. Thank you for that. So Jayshree's comment for those of you who aren't uh, able to see the chat, she said the final thoughts are what we need to accelerate action is dogged determination, collaboration, empathy for the poor and marginalized. Um, so, so well, well said. Um, I won't try to close on top of that because I think there is so much wisdom embodied in all four of those responses and a lot of moments ahead to convene through the, uh, the Adaptation Summit and then the events leading up to COP26 as well. We have one last speaker series of the year. It is coming up on December 10th. Um, we will be looking at what we have learned while, we'll, while we are still learning uh, in the midst of the pandemic. Um, we'll be sending out the invitation soon. It will have some very interesting um, speakers coming to you, so you will not want to miss it. Please look out for that. Um, and uh, until then, thank you, everyone, for participating and joining us. 
this evening. Thank you, Jerry, uh, Yuri, for standing in as my co-host tonight. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers, to Desmond, to Jayshree, to Duncan, to Arnaud. Thank you for being here with us. Um, may you all have a very uh, healthy, happy, and safe few weeks until we meet again. Good night from Singapore. Thank you, Lauren. See you Bye. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.